Great Good job. Night. Okay, so I have the honor of introducing our next panel. First of all, my name is Cindy Zyker, and I'm with Zyker Research, and I'm the co-principal investigator for our NSF planning grant, which is funding this workshop. I have the honor of introducing our presenters for this panel on broadening participation in the engineering pathway, critical transitions. So our first panelist is Dr. Steve F.A., who is the principal investigator for this NSF Includes project. Steve is an assistant professor at Morgan State University in the School of Engineering. He will be presenting on a literature review that has helped guide this workshop and helped us um, determine from the literature who would be interesting to invite as an expert. He will be presenting um, for about 20, 15 minutes, followed by Dr. Pamela Lee Mack. Dr. F.A. earned his BS in civil engineering at the University of Ibadan and received his PhD in civil engineering at Morgan State University. Dr. Pamela Lee Mack, who is a professor at, and chair at the Department of Engineering in Virginia State University will follow his presentation. She has served as Dean of the School of Engineering, Science and Technology at BSU and chair of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Com Computer Engineering at Morgan State University. Dr. Lee Mack received a BS degree in mathematics from Virginia Union University, BS from an MS degrees in electrical engineering from Howard University and a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Delaware. She has also worked in industry for the General Electric Space Systems Division. And she will be followed by our last presenter for this panel, Dr. Julius Davis, Associate Professor of Mathematics Education and Director of the Center for Research and Mentoring of Black Male Students and Teachers at Bowie State University. Dr. Davis has two main strands of research focused on black students and teachers in urban and suburban schools. His research of black students critically examines their mathematical achievement and experiences on how policies shape their mathematics education. We are honored to have this panel. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Steve Effie. Um, Steve, I think you have to unmute. All right, thank you, Cindy. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you everyone for joining this meeting. Uh, before I start, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Washington uh, for that great presentation. Uh, so you're all welcome to the NSF Includes Planning Grant Workshop, uh, which is to increase the representation of minorities in engineering. So these are the project team members, um, starting with Dr. Kemi Ladeji Osas, who is a professor at Morgan State University, and then myself, uh, then Dr. Cindy Zyker, who is the executive director of Zyker Enterprises, uh, Dr. Clay Gloucester, who is the dean of graduate college, North Carolina A&T State University, and then we have Dr. Kamal Ali, he's a professor of electrical engineering at Jackson State University. And then we have uh, Carol Carter, who is the founder and executive director of Global Minded. It's very important that we acknowledge uh, NSF, the National Science Foundation for funding this project. So I wanna say thank you for funding our projects. Thank you. So, how did we start? Um, so basically we leveraged on our past work, um, such as the ESEM project and uh, the E4USA and also the HBCUDCL projects. We seek to increase the representation of minorities in engineering. There are a number of um, needs that we also identified in some of our projects, uh, which relates to uh, the pay gap uh, when it comes to STEM worker. Uh, we found that there is a sizable pay gaps uh, by gender, race, and ethnicity. And also we found out that there is still underrepresentation of women in engineering and computer sciences field. And also we found out 
that there is still this iron discrimination of minority groups that exist. Um, in the last few decades, there has not been uh, a significant change. And these are some of the things that we leveraged on uh, in this project. So what are the guiding questions for this workshop? So the first guiding question is to come up with a clear evidence-based pathway to achieve population parity in engineering fields within and across academia and industry. The second guiding question is how can barriers to success be diminished for Blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans and other underrepresented groups in engineering? This aligns with the NSF includes uh, design elements, which focuses on shared vision and partnership. So we started this project by doing a systematic review, which is still a work in progress. And we came up with research question, uh, synthesis questions. And uh, there are four of them that we developed. Uh, the first one is what are the status and trends in STEM education research? from 2015 to 2021 based on journal publications. What are the patterns of publications in engineering education research across different journals? What are the main topics that have emerged that addresses challenges faced by minority based on journal publications? So the first step was uh, to identify seminar articles uh, for our systematic review. So one of the articles that we found was London uh, uh, et al. 2020, which kind of guide the process of the systematic review. And we were able to identify 1,125 records uh, by searching databases uh, using the publication dates uh, from 1975 to 2021. So we then went for, uh, forward to look at the 1,125 records that were identified previously. And uh, we came up with inclusion and exclu exclusion criteria. And we were able to filter out 773 articles uh, because of the fact that they were duplicates. And some of them are not related to STEM or the research uh, that we are conducting. And 352 articles were retrieved and subjected to inclusion and uh, exclusion criteria. And we came up with 98 articles for our systematic review. So for the research question one, which uh, seeks to look at the status and trends in STEM education research from 2015 to the end of 2021, uh, we did not include 2021 because uh, we are still in the year 2021. So uh, as you can see on this chart right here, we, you can see an appreciable increase in the number of journal publications over the years. Uh, however, if you look at the right uh, portion of my slide, you will see that there is no constant change in the number of pub publications. Uh, from 2015 to 2020. Uh, the, the highest uh, uh, publication was recorded in 2017 and also in 2019. It will be interesting to know what happens beyond 2020 uh, post-pandemic period. For research question two, we looked at the patterns of publications in edu engineering educational research across different journals and uh, those that are relevant to the research. And what we found out is that uh, most of the publications are focused on university education. Uh, there are a few focuses on uh, community college and workforce. What that means is that there is uh, less study in those areas. And uh, the goal of this workshop is to kind of um, spur research in those areas that we have gaps such as research in community college and in workforce. Looking at the target population, what we found out is that most of the articles do not specify the ethnicity or race uh, in their publication. And uh, they focus majorly on underrepresented minorities or URM. 
and a very few of the articles were focused on Native Americans and Hispanics. So this is interesting because it shows that there is not a highly uh, studied, these are not highly studied area and uh, these are area that we would like to see more variations within the populations and not just focus on the underrepresented minority as stated in those journals. Also, we looked at those topics that have emerged that addresses the challenges faced by minority institutions based on journal publications. We found out that uh, there are a few articles that really addresses uh, system, system level challenges faced by uh, minorities uh, in engineering. Uh, so you can see here that there are uh, fewer publications focusing on institutional change on equity, on knowledge building and social justice. Most of the publications are focused on retention. So I'm going to go over this very quickly because of my time. Um, so what are the emerging themes in the literature and uh, what are the needs that has to be addressed? So what we have done in, these, uh, in preparing for this workshop is to put together panels and experts that can address these needs. So one of the emerging theme is the issue of underrepresentation of Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans in engineering. And we would like the experts to address uh, such needs as improvement uh, in the achievement in math and science, uh, how to create equitable learning environment in our various uh, minority institution, how to retain uh, from matriculation to degree completion, uh, those populations that are reflective of min uh, minority institution diverse demographics, how to increase and support a diverse engineering faculty, how to increase communication and visibility of minority institution efforts, and how to commit to a leadership position to direct inclusion, diversity, and equity efforts. Another, another emerging theme is the underrepresentation of women in engineering and computer sciences field. So these are the needs of uh, the need of female students achievement in math and science, uh, the need to address conception of race and ethnicity of these groups, which affects participation in science and engineering field, the need to increase representation of women in the science and engineering workforce and to support women faculty and to increase their opportunities. So another emerging theme that we came up with is the hiring discrimination of minority groups. And the needs includes how to establish policies to remedy discrimination in hiring women and minorities, how to improve the culture and receptiveness of institutions and companies towards minorities, how to create a pathway and increase pipeline to middle and senior management roles in institutions and industry. How can we provide more flexibility to accommodate work hours and structures for women and underrepresented groups in institution and industry? How do we support women and underrepresented faculty against bias and discrimination? How do we ensure that hiring and management practices do expand diversity, diversity and eliminate bias? So what is the goal of this workshop? So the goal of this workshop is to develop a shared vision and strategic plan for an alliance that will be led by minority serving institution that will address system level challenge around minority enrollment in engineering and to crystallize partnership between academia and industry to address this change. Also to establish a research and implementation agenda that informs the field of BPE in engineering while contributing to advancing the goals of the NSF includes national network through the coordination of. So once again, I want to say thank you to everyone and uh, we wish you a great time uh, in the workshop. 
thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. F.A. That was a wonderful presentation. So you can stop sharing your screen and we will have our next presenter, Dr. Pamela Lee Mack, who is going to talk with us about critical transitions. And while she's putting her slides up, I just wanted to have one question for Dr. F.A. And um, Dr. F.A., when you were doing that literature review and noticing that there were few articles about Native Americans and Hispanics, can you tell us a little bit about your own research and what you are studying? All right, thank you very much. Uh, so basically we are looking at the, uh, the trends and also the, uh, the populations that have been targeted in some of uh, the articles that are out there. And uh, we found out that there are few articles that are focused on uh, these groups, these minority groups. Uh, so uh, one of the research that we are doing is how can we increase their representation? Uh, what are the approaches and how do we uh, reach out to these groups uh, from K-12, uh, you know, along the pathway? So uh, what we found out uh, prior was that there are few research that have addressed some of the system level challenges that are faced by these minority groups, especially Native Americans and Hispanics. And it's important that we as researcher and uh, experts address those gaps. Okay, well, thank you so much. And now I'm gonna ask Dr. Pamela Lee Mack to unmute her, her microphone so that she can present on critical transitions. And thank you again, Dr. F.A. Okay, can you, you can hear me? Yes, welcome Dr. Lee Mack. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, so yes, I'm uh, Pamela Lee Mack. I'm chair of the Department of Engineering uh, at Virginia State University. And thank you, Sydney, for having me uh, here uh, today. So I want to uh, just uh, talk about the, the critical uh, transition points that I see in terms of uh, students getting to engineering at uh, post-secondary education and then uh, pursuing an engineering uh, degree and then what they do next. So I've divided the uh, critical points uh, into kind of two areas, uh, entrance and early on in terms of students going from high school to college and then what happens when they leave college? I mean, certainly you can look at the critical points of beginning you know, in K through 12, uh, but I'm going to focus on the high school to college and then from college and exit. So from early on, again, we look at high school to college and that's the initial transition from let's say a 12th grade to freshman year. Uh, the lower division, Division to the upper division uh, next, instead of just looking at first year, I'm looking at the first and second year, which I think are the critical points uh, in terms of the curriculum, and then a community college to college. I'll spend some time on that because I want to talk about kind of a potential model for that uh, in terms of when students are going from community college to college. And then finally, to look at uh, college to the workplace and graduate school. And why do we want to do this? Why are we looking at the critical points? Certainly retention and persistence in engineering is critical. We've had issues in terms of the percentage of students who are retained in engineering and their persistence for uh, many, many years. So that has been a longstanding problem. So we need to look at the critical points to see how we can increase those numbers. Also broadening the pool 
whether it be for students coming from high school, increasing those numbers, or students coming for community college. And finally, to making sure that our students are ready as they exit from undergraduate school. So when we look at from high school to college, uh, we certainly think about the preparation of our students. Uh, that can be from the exposure of the students to engineering and also some of the sciences and, and math courses, because as we look at many of the high schools, depending on where the students are coming from, particularly the underrepresented uh, students in engineering, then sometimes their schools don't offer calculus as an example. And so, and even physics, some of the institutions don't have uh, faculty to teach the physics courses. So our students are not necessarily exposed to the courses that they need uh, for engineering or they do not have uh, engineering uh, exposure, whether it be in the high school and the family, et cetera. Uh, mathematics uh, readiness is another thing. Again, this has been a longstanding uh, problem. Uh, students coming out of high school, they haven't been uh, informed of what math courses they should take if they want to uh, major in engineering in, uh, in college. So many times they take, let's say three years of mathematics, they haven't had any trigonometry, any pre-calculus or calculus. And so they are at a uh, deficit when they start the university. So then the question is that what can be done? Certainly there are many programs such as bridge programs that many universities offer, which help the students. Uh, but also we'll talk a little bit about curriculum later in terms of how the curriculum at the university uh, can help and it's certainly impactful for the students. So the preparation of the students are really is critical in terms of how they enter a college. When we talk about broadening the pool, uh, we think about many times universities are looking for students with a certain GPA to major in engineering. Some universities you can't get into the engineering programs if you don't have a 3.0 or higher. And so I think that we need to look at what does it take to become an engineer or major in engineering? And certainly uh, having the exposure in the certain mathematics courses or having those courses in high school certainly are uh, excellent and are needed. But we need to think about engineering as a creative field that the, the critical courses are important, but the GPA doesn't tell the whole story. So I think we need to widen the net in general and also particularly for women in, interested in engineering. Because again, if you look at the female students, if they don't have high GPAs, oftentimes they don't think that they can excel in engineering. And we know that's not the case. So if we want to broaden the pool, we need to widen the net for all of our students and particularly for underrepresented students to get them interested in engineering. And thirdly, I talk about the circle of influence. The circle of influence are people, whether it be the family, whether it be mentors, those individuals who have a large impact on students. So we know that in terms of the family, oftentimes the mother has a major, has a major impact and influence on whether the student is going to choose engineering or not, or whatever major the students choose, and other family members. It could be a, a guardian for students. They may not have you know, lived with their parents, but some of the guardian or mentors. So I think we need to begin to look at those individuals who help students in terms of making a decision. Uh, and so those are some of the components when we think about the transition from high school to college. And we know a number of things, whether it be placement tests, a number of things come into play, but I'm just kind of uh, indicating some of the things that we need to consider and why uh, this is a critical point. Now, once the students get to the university, then 
what are we talking about? Again, we go back to the mathematics as one example when we think about curriculum. For many years, again, this has been a historical problem in terms of mathematics being a, a gatekeeper or a gateway uh, course for our students. And so if the students do not start in the appropriate or the ready course for them in mathematics, then they're going to be behind. If they start to high level that they're not ready, then they're not gonna be successful. So it's very important that the students start in the right math course, but also that these courses are not uh, taught in isolation, that the mathematics is taught with, and I say more than applied, but it's really in terms of, so the students can see themselves in the mathematics and also see themselves in the engineering. So we think about whether it's social impact, which is very important, uh, I think, and we know for females that's critically important, but I think all students, uh, particularly underrepresented students, we talk about the social impact. Why are we doing uh, engineering? So whether it be the freshman year or the sophomore year, I think that we need to look at the curriculum and ensure that we have social uh, impact and students understand how they can use the engineering, not just apply uh, problems, but really going to the uh, way the students see themselves. Uh, in terms of my second one, in terms of pedagogy. So again, it's not only the, the students uh, and what their needs are, but in terms of the faculty, what faculty can do to meet the students' needs. In terms of ensuring that faculty understand the different ways of teaching, also learning styles, okay, how students learn best. Going, and also going back to what I indicated about the curriculum, faculty are the ones who are going to develop the curriculum, okay, develop those projects, uh, develop those performance tasks to ensure that uh, the students uh, see their community, things that are concerned in their community in those kinds of projects that they are working on. So uh, pedagogy, how the faculty uh, teach those courses, are, are, that's really important. Uh, lastly here, again, this is lower division to upper division, are the effective fact factors, whether it be self-efficacy, a self-identity, those things we don't focus on enough. And so you're gonna hear about that later. My colleague from Virginia State University, Dr. Cheryl Talley, is gonna be on one of the panels. She's done research and she does research in this area. But really the students need to have confidence that they can perform. They need to, uh, again, have that self-efficacy, and that identity. So effective factors are critically important uh, in engineering. And again, how they get those, how they do those, whether it's real mentoring, that's one example that they can have role models that they can see who have gone through either training in order to uh, increase their chances of being successful uh, in engineering. Uh, now I move from high school to uh, college and from lower division to upper division. Just wanna spend a little time on community college to college. Across the country, you know, we have community college systems, we have individual community college. There are a variety. Uh, but one of the things I want to talk about, a little bit about the Commonwealth of Virginia and what we're uh, doing here. So uh, nationwide, certainly, the community colleges have a, a large pool of students. So that's about broadening our pool. However, there are low transfer rates when we talk about students going on to a college. In general, 80% of uh, students, when they go to the community college, 80% of those students say that they want to earn a BS degree. But only 31% of those students actually transfer. So the question is that what can be done to increase that? So we think that there needs to be a systemic change. And there's a model that is underway in the Commonwealth of Virginia 
Uh, it's a potential model, I should say, because we're still in the process. They're looking for a two plus two model that students spend two years in the community college and then two years uh, at the university. And we call that Transfer Virginia. I'll talk a little bit about uh, that. So uh, this uh, comes from the director who is Patricia Parker. So this is some of the statistics involving the community colleges in Virginia. So only 19% of community college students transfer uh, in two years. And then 34% of the students who transfer really get a BS degree in two years. Again, we're talking about a two plus two model for the program. 6.6% .6 of the transfer students complete that program in the four years. So that's for the student population in general. When we look at underrepresented students, then only 17% of those students transferred to two year, in two years. 32% transfer that transfer get their degrees in two years and 5.3% of transfer students complete that 2.2 uh, plus two model. So that's what's happening in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so the desire is to really figure out how can we have students transfer from community colleges to four year institutions and get a degree, bachelor's degree in four years. That's the goal. And so the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, started this program probably a couple of years ago. And again, I men mentioned the project director of that. So they designated a project director, but the educators, community colleges, as well as universities convene to really talk about the problem. So that was kind of the first step in this. And what happened after that was to really to establish these faculty teams. And so across the Commonwealth again, and they started with engineering, computer science, as well as education. The idea is really to do this across disciplines, whether it's to humanities, et cetera, business. So that's what the desire is. But they started a couple of years ago with those three uh, areas. After that, then they dug, dug um, lower into specific disciplines. Just an example, electrical and computer engineering, which I was involved in, mechanical engineering, they had other engineering disciplines involved. And what's happening is that faculty at the community colleges and universities are working at the course content level, getting down to looking at examining syllabi for the various courses. As an example for electrical and computer engineering, we were looking at, again, courses that students may take in the community colleges. And we want to make sure they can transfer those into the university. Signals and systems, as an example, circuits, programming, digital systems for electrical and computer engineering, those were the subject areas. Again, the working groups got down at the course content uh, level. And so uh, the plan is really to start this program in fall 2020. The course content has been identified for those courses, again, that the students can take at the community college to make sure that those transfer uh, to the university. And that's gonna start in fall 2020. 22. And the key is that universities are supposed to fix their curricula for two years. So this is something uh, very new and different. Hopefully, if this works, this will be something that other states uh, can, um, can do as well. And finally, when we talk about uh, after college, what happens when students get ready to go to the workplace or to graduate school? And so when we looked at the National Association of Colleges and Employers, there are four competencies and that the top four uh, that have been on their list probably for the last four or five years that they consider to be absolutely essential or essential. And you can see there's critical thinking and problem solving, teamwork, collaboration, professionalism and work ethics and or and written communications. Although this survey was of employees were not just engineering, 
But I think that we can see that these are the skill sets that we hear from industry as well. And so we need to look at avenues that we can ensure we maximize the way that our students uh, obtain and are proficient and excel in terms of these skill set. Uh, socialization is an area that has been identified in terms of key for students in terms of making that transition and being ready for uh, the workplace. And that talks about building relationships. Again, mentoring has been identified as a way to uh, maximize that. And then in terms of graduate school, certainly, you know, there's a number of things. I'm just uh, kind of mentioning uh, one thing that's really critical is really to ensure that our undergraduates know early about what it, what it takes to be, uh, to be successful in graduate school, uh, what the parameters are, also making connections with other graduate schools through their faculty. So relationships are gonna be critically important. And one thing I should mention here is that, you know, oftentimes, sorry, oftentimes we talk about uh, getting more of our students to go into graduate school. We have to understand, particularly for underrepresented students, that sometimes it's pressure uh, from family because uh, the students, many of them may not know about, you know, engineering in terms of, uh, having a source of income that when the students get their degree, they certainly have a large source of income. And so they may have pressure from the family to go out and start working. That's the real thing, okay, in terms of what needs to be considered. So it's really educating the students, somehow educating the family. And educating the family actually goes back to, it's the end and also in the beginning, that's something very important when students are starting to go to the university because the family may not have that understanding. So it's us educating the family at that point uh, as well. So I've kind of given you uh, what I think are the critical transition points uh, from high school to when the students leave for graduate school or the workplace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemack. That was fantastic and very enlightening. And while we get our next set of slides up for Dr. Julius Davis, I just want to thank you for representing the women in engineering. And um, one person, one of our students yesterday um, wanted to ask you, how did you find a way to persevere with all the challenges faced by women in engineering? Can you just, in a very brief um, recap, how did you find ways to persevere as a woman in engineering? Well, I, you know, I tell you, well, one of the things my, you know, it goes back to a number of, of things. My mother always told me that there's no such word as can't. That that was kind of the, the bottom line. And so I never forgot that. Uh, and so if I had any kind of, uh, you know, adversity, then those were the words in the back of my mind. And also I always had uh, mentors along the way. I think mentors are, are critically you know, important. And so, you know, whether it was Dr. McCrary, who, when I started at Virginia Union, before I got into engineering, got me into engineering, and Dr. Uh, Dean Eugene DeLoach, who had served as a mentor for me. So a number of people, uh, you know, have uh, served as uh, mentors for me along the, along the way. Uh, and so, uh, Pat Daniels, I think about Pat Daniels, who was at Seattle University, uh, when I became a department chair, so there have been people around me along the way. And so I think that you know, having mentors is really important to that success for anyone. Thank you so much. And now we have the honor and privilege of our next presenter, um, Dr. Julius Davis, speaking, speaking to us today about early and sustained STEM exposure and experiences for black male students. And take it away, Dr. Davis. Well, thank you, Cindy. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you all for inviting me to this uh, workshop. And I appreciate all the work that my colleagues have set the stage for the conversation. And I get the pleasure of talking about something that I love to talk about all day, every day, which is Black males and STEM. And what I will do a little bit differently from my colleagues is I'll start a little bit earlier in the pipeline. And I'll also even kind of take it back to President Washington's uh, notion about a K-12 framework in this conversation. Um, so just thinking about setting the context with a, a sense of the literature that we know that it's very important 
to uh, develop healthy identity development. I think some of my colleagues have already shared that in this panel, particularly on racial, ethnic, and in the STEM discipline lines. And we know that peer influence and learning community play a big role in shaping the identity development of black male students. But one of the things that we also realize in looking at the landscape, the literature, is that there's limited STEM exposure in programs in K through 12 schools. Uh, there's limited uh, exposure in programs outside of school settings, which impacts students understanding the importance of STEM early on, particularly in engineering and computer engineering areas or computer science areas. Uh, we typically get students to be exposed to mathematics and science, but computer science, computer engineering, um, and areas in the engineering fields, they have very limited exposures early on. And so we know that mathematics, as my colleagues have already shared, is a very critical area, but I would surmise that engineering and technology fields like computer science and computer engineering are equally important at those middle school levels. And I think that we need to really address that. Um, and one other point of consideration is that we typically don't have elementary educators and early childhood educators who have sufficient knowledge base in STEM areas to help cultivate the type of um, understanding that we wanna develop in our young people at the early stages, which I think goes back to President Washington's perspective about how we need to be thinking differently about education for the future. Uh, many of our young people are not getting that in the foundational stages of their learning. One of the other things I think Dr. Lemax shared is the academic challenges, but oftentimes these academic challenges become particularly acute at the middle school level, which is very important for us to take in consideration as we need students to be on an algebra track, or a college performance track. But we also know that student-teacher relationships impact this. We know that they impact whether students get exposure to advanced mathematics or advanced curriculum or advanced programs. They're often um, excluded because of a teacher recommendation. And we know that black male students in particular often have disciplinary challenges. Uh, they're limited exposure to gifted education in these early grades because they're contingent upon um, strained relationships with the predominantly white female teaching workforce that have challenges in connecting with our black male students. That sets the literature context for how we think about STEM in this early stage. Uh, we, we conducted a national study, a mixed methods design study of black male students at the middle school level participating in out of school STEM experiences at four HBCUs around the country. Um, this program were conducted in, during the school year during the summer, uh, we interviewed uh, the students that participated in the program. We interviewed the black male mentors. And in some programs, uh, black females also served as mentors. Um, in many of the programs, the models were very different the time, from the time frame to who actually taught in the program. And so I'd like to share just a brief snapshot of some of the research. And so thinking about it from some of the qualitative research results. Um, from a qualitative perspective, we conducted individual focus group interviews and conducted classroom observations. I would say these four blocks represent some of what we saw to represent the success of black males in these programs. One of the things that we continuously heard in these programs is that they couldn't keep up with how fast the young men were learning the material. Um, one of the other things that we learned in talking to the young men was that they didn't have this type of STEM exposure in their school settings and that their teachers were not often equipped to cultivate their curiosity or intellectual um, advancement in the STEM areas at their school sites. There are very few of them who had actual experiences in their schools in a STEM area, but these programs provided them with an opportunity to be exposed to STEM, on some cases over an extended period of time, meaning multiple years, um, they participated in the program. So, just to give you an example of some of the things that we thought were some of the, the, the um, things that helped them to be successful was it started with relationships. And most of their mentors, as I stated, were black male students who were at the co collegiate level, most of whom were STEM majors, some of whom were not, but they really took time to get to know the young men, ate lunch with them, really tried to get to know them as a person first. And then what they also did was they used their own experiences and what they knew of the young men to impact the curriculum. Um, they would incorporate things like tennis shoes, 
uh, music, things that they knew that the students were interested in and that they all shared a common interest in. And those things were integrated into how they mentored and instructed the students. And so you can see here that in many cases, the culturally uh, responsive mentor, which also goes back to President Washington's perspective about these culturally responsive or relevant approaches that were needed to be infused into our recruitment lines, I think that they also need to be infused within our mentoring and our pedagogical structures in terms of how we connect with young men at these early stages so that they cannot see STEM as a white male dominated field, but also see their place within the space. And so when you look at it from a culturally responsive pedagogical perspective, the black males um, who worked with these, these young men often realized that they weren't just dealing with one type of young man. They dealt with young men who were very quick on their feet. They dealt with young men who needed hands-on, who needed visual. And so all of those things impacted their approach to instruction that impacted these, um, their, their success in these environments. And we observed these things in our classroom observations. The quantitative results matched what we saw in the qualitative results. And we also know in the literature that there's very few studies of black male students' participation in STEM programs that actually examine these things from a quantitative perspective. And so we thought that it was both important to include both the voices and the quantitative measures of these students' success. And so to kind of put these quantitative measures in context for you to help understand the qualitative results, essentially, we saw a lot of significant correlations um, between meaningful learning, learning community, teacher, student, uh, relationship quality, all of these impacted the level of STEM engagement and critical thinking, which I think goes back to Professor Lee Mack's comment about we know that critical thinking is important. And we found that these correlations, when these things were present, the critical uh, thinking for students uh, uh, um, were significantly improved. But even from a multiple regression perspective, those things combined significantly impact critical thinking and critical engagement with the content in the STEM areas. And so we've noticed uh, from the pre and post test results that there was an increase in STEM based academic uh, efficacy, particularly when we think about it from a computer engineering or a technology base from these students who participated in these programs. So as I would offer as some recommendations to increase the recommendations at these early stages and sustain it, I think we gotta continue the campaign of helping to educate parents about the importance of STEM areas. Uh, we know from many of these young men that they didn't join these STEM programs because they wanted to. Their parents forced them and then they fell in love with these STEM areas. But we also knew from these young men, from interviewing them, STEM wasn't their first priority. Even though they had positive self-efficacy about STEM and their abilities, STEM was still not a priority on their list. And I would wager to say this, part of it is the exposure and the other competing values that are in their life that are probably more important. I think that we even have to start earlier than middle school. I think that um, some of the work of like Brian Wright in early childhood education suggests that we need to even start that early. But I think in these early elementary, early childhood age, we need to be really engaging and cultivating the STEM knowledge of black male students. And I would say other youth as well. Um, I think that we see the intellectual curiosity in those stages that is not often cultivated. Uh, we know from even the work of Habrowski that parents have played a big role in the early stages in terms of exposing their, STEM, their children to STEM through blocks and other experiences. And I think that we gotta continue to cultivate that. And it has to be integrated into our elementary, elementary and middle school settings. And I think that one of the things that I think, um, going back to President Washington's uh, earlier keynote, while funding is important, I think funding is extremely important. And I think also connections to the workforce is important from what we've learned from these STEM programs. Many of these young people got to interact with technology that they wouldn't have gotten an opportunity to do in their regular K through 12 experience. And that was partly because of the partnership with industry that could give them the opportunity to engage with technologies that are not often available to K through 12 teachers. And so I think that having their experiences over years, we need to have them in multiple years so that we can begin to really shape their perspective of seeing themselves in a STEM discipline. Um, I think we need to increase the opportunities for STEM experiences in the K through 12, throughout the whole K through 12 pipeline. And almost like we do mathematics, there should be targeted specific STEM experiences throughout that expand, expand beyond mathematics and science, 
that I would say include engineering in a more deliberate way. Um, and the STEM content should be connected to the students' lived experiences and their culture. And I think that we got to continue to um, use black males in STEM at the collegiate level to help to influence these young people so that they can see themselves in the picture of these STEM success stories that we see at the collegiate level. I think that we also have to continue to provide them with the proper challenge in STEM content. Um, and many of these programs, students are doing STEM content at the collegiate level. And I think that we have to continue to do that and provide them with the academic supports like they did in these programs. Um, one of the things that we've also learned in not just this work, but just looking at this work across the board and other research projects is that most of our STEM teachers, um, as President Washington talked about, is that they need upskilling and reskilling in STEM areas. Many of them don't have the knowledge base and the pedagogy to um, advance our students in a STEM area and they need advancement. And I think that, I think he's mentioned that a complete overhaul or a complete infusion in that K through 12 pipeline is important. And I think that's necessary. But I think going back to this early stages, I think that we need more longitudinal studies to know that these programs are working and what's really working so that we can kind of talk about them like what we know at the collegiate level. We need to know more about these at the early pipeline. And I think that would pretty much end. And I would invite you to look at some of the articles that we recently produced in the special issue um, in the Journal of African-American Males in Education that gives more insight into some of the work that we've done and collaborated with colleagues across the country who are doing similar work with young people at the early stages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. And so as um, I mentioned earlier, our student orientation yesterday produced a few questions for each panel. And for your session, Dr. Davis, our students were wondering about um, the fact that building lifelong mentorships early could help foster a passion and interest in STEM. So what do you think about at what level of K-12 should mentor relationships be introduced in order for them to be effective? Um, I think that they need to start at the ele elementary level. Um, and I think that they need to be sustained over time. Um, I think one of the things that I often think about with mentoring with young people is that they need consistency of the people in their lives. And I would say that it should start in the elementary, elementary school level and continue throughout their K through 12. They need to continuously be exposed to mentors, diverse mentors, so that they can see the diverse pathways into STEM. Because once you start looking at the pipeline, you'll see that everybody has entered STEM at different points. Some at the high school level, as Dr. Lehi Lemack mentioned, um, and some at the collegiate level. And so some folks didn't even know that STEM was even an option until later on. And so I think that we just need multiple levels of mentorship along the whole pathway. Thank you. And one more question. What steps, what next steps would you like to see taken to encourage young men of color to pursue STEM careers? Um, I think that is a, that's a, that's a multi-pronged um, step. I think um, one thing is that I think that there needs to be a complete overhaul of STEM curriculum, um, not just for the content, but who are the contributors. Most of what is known about any STEM discipline suggests that white males have been the only contributors to any worthwhile knowledge in STEM. There are many people of different backgrounds that have contributed to STEM, and I think that that needs to be one step. I think a diversification of the teacher workforce needs to be another step, and I think a constant infusion and exposure of STEM uh, pathways and career pathways, and even entrepreneurship. I don't think that we ought to just continue to force young people into thinking about just working for others, but also innovation in, in STEM areas that they should be contributing themselves. As um, our keynote addressed, there have been young people in their teens and in their 20s who have contributed significantly to STEM advancement. And I think that we have to encourage an entrepreneurial way of thinking about STEM for our young people, not just workforce. Thank you so much. Um, there was a comment by a student yesterday. It's not exactly a question, but I hope you can elaborate on his thoughts. And he said during his K-12 years and growing up, he really didn't have very much exposure to the historical success of people of color in engineering and in other STEM fields. And how do you think that can be altered um, for the next generation of upcoming um, engineering students? So is, are you asking anybody in particular? Uh, 
Well, Pamela, if you have an answer for me, that would be great. I was asking uh, either of you. Uh, uh, no, I think that, uh, you know, in terms of, we, we certainly have to get uh, more people of color in front of young people, you know, whether it's, in, whether it's uh, teachers, uh, whether it's somehow, you know, uh, alumni from universities to go back to the, you know, K through 12 schools, we have to get more people of color in front of those young people. And so there are various, you know, ways to, to, to do that. I think that's important. And I know this student was concerned that curriculum and like historical um, information okay. in the curriculum okay. did okay. not represent the people of color's accomplishments. Okay. And he was really shocked to find out much later that this had been a misstep in his education. So how do you see that being transformed? Huh. Yeah, that's that's probably a tough one because you know, well, <laughs> I want to get political, but that but but that's uh, something I think that there's uh, issues in general sometimes having the curriculum reflect what you know has happened. So I'm not sure if I have an, an answer for that, but you know, one of the things that in uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia we have a STEM Education Commission, and so sometimes we are able to provide you know input. Uh, in terms of what kinds of things, what how the curriculum should change. So those who have voices in places where you know you can have input into how the curriculum should change, I think more of us need to to do that. And um, Dr. Davis, do you have a comment about that? Having more <laughs> of a culturally representative and responsive curriculum, how could we transform to seeing that become more popular? Uh, I think that's. A, a, a big undertaking. Um, and I say that because most of our K through 12 teachers don't know about other groups' contributions to STEM. Um, for myself, I didn't learn about any other group's contribution to STEM field until I got to college. And that was significantly influenced by my mentor, um, Dr. Abdul Alim Shabazz, when I was an undergrad. He was the first person to ever tell me that. That completely changed my life. And I think that for me, when I get an opportunity to interact with young people because I have that knowledge, I share that and I encourage others who are in STEM fields to do the same. If we have the knowledge, we have to continuously infuse it into our programming and our experiences. And as I shared, even in the special issue, uh, Dr. Kimmet Shockley at Howard University has a piece on integrating African-centered education into STEM that I think is worthwhile to read for others um, to consider. Thank you very much. And now for both of you, one last question, and we only have about two minutes, but during this very hard pandemic year, um, a lot of lost learning has been documented, but how do you think we can um, pick up the pace and reboot um, this summer and this coming year in order to help students get a leg up after such a difficult challenge during the pandemic? Do you wanna take that one, Pamela? So, well, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think of it from the higher education, you know, level and, and what we can, can do. Um, so I think that, number one, we need to uh, look at what things have been successful. It's been challenging for our students. I can tell you that it's been extremely challenging. So I think, we, number one, we need to be empathetic uh, with those students. And as they come back, and we're supposed to be face-to-face, -face, uh, really, um, you know, let that be understanding and let them know that we do understand what they have gone through. And then, but we do need to get back in some semblance in terms of what is normal, you know, operation. But I think it's dialoguing with, this, with our students and really kind of have a personal touch for them. Thank you. Dr. Davis, do you have a comment about moving forward? after such a hard year for our students? Um, I think for me, uh, one has been just to humanize this space. This has been challenging for all of us. And I think sometimes uh, we've lost sight of how this has impacted us from a human perspective. And I think even more so with our students and their families. I mean, the, 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 the loss of family members, their own emotional, uh, social struggles. I think that we got to humanize this space and, and just recoup, recoup people in that space and then move forward on the other level. That's just my own perspective. Thank you so much. 
um, to both of you and to Dr. Steve F.A. for his presentation. We're going to transition right into our next presentation, um, which is a really good um, um, flip from learning about students of color and early um, STEM engagement for minority males to now our women's panel on women in engineering. And this panel is